It's called the Forgotten Corner, a windswept landscape that at first seems barren, lifeless. But these last remnants of untouched prairie on the southern borders of Alberta and Saskatchewan support an abundance of life. Grasslands and potholes feed a rich community that coexists in mutual dependence. The flower and the bee intersect, serving each other's purposes. They build new growth, grazing for the mule deer and the whitetail, and for the pronghorn antelope, shaggy with summer molt. The prairie rattler hunts among the flowers, and the rare burrowing owl, alert for danger, still finds sanctuary. Okay, Dwight, I'm gonna hand you this cage. Now a creature that's been missing here for almost 50 years is coming home. The swift fox, smallest of our native foxes, once roamed freely on these southern grasslands. But by 1940, it had disappeared from Canada. For 15 years, environmentalists, biologists, and private citizens have worked to put this least of foxes back where it belongs. It's a symbol of a new beginning a changing attitude to the land and the life it holds. But it isn't proving easy. Once the intricate relationships of life in nature are broken, it's very hard to re-establish them. The history of the prairie landscape goes back a very long way. It took vast tracts of time and powerful natural forces to create this unique environment at the center of the continent. 10,000 years ago, the last glaciers retreated north from here, leaving the land scarred and scraped bare. Slowly it was colonized by grasses, which built the fertile soil and held it down with tenacious roots. The grasslands, shaped by extremes of temperature and an arid climate, fueled an astonishing gathering of life. An ocean of grazing animals flowed over the land, a reservoir of food for other species that seemed inexhaustible. Then the equilibrium was broken, and change began to happen very fast. Firearms dispatched the bison in just a few decades. With them went the human cultures that had lived there for thousands of years. New owners took possession, waves of settlers laying claim to an endless expanse of fertile soil. But this new life was based on a terrible misunderstanding. The plow that broke the sod shattered a fragile balance. Once plowed, the soil began to lose its long-built fertility, 
and its ancient community of life. Animals were hunted down for food and fur, or because they threatened the new agriculture. For the farmers, wolves were the main target, but along the way they eliminated the swift fox, almost by mistake. Victims of a battle for territory, wolves and foxes disappeared together into prairie history. Since then, the demands of a growing economy have turned more than 80% of the original prairie into cropland. The soil's organic matter, built up over 10,000 years, has been depleted in less than a century. In spite of droughts, dust bowls and crop failures, the process continues today. During a lifetime of farming in southern Saskatchewan, Lees and Fernand Perrault have watched the prairie go. It's disappearing so quickly you wouldn't believe it. They're plowing it up all the time and uh, it's disappearing very quickly and there's very little of it left. But I think keep. some of them farmers are starting to, to see the point now, like, well, especially with these low prices and government help supposed to be in there, they're banging their heads against the wall as far as I'm concerned. Just like I was doing right down here back in 47, 48. It's no good for I, I worked that field there for eight years, and I ended up by having to sell, sell cows to pay the gas bill. That's when I finally smartened up a little bit. Other farmers have learned the same hard lesson. This creek bed area on another farm nearby is part of a new way of thinking about productivity and the land. Thelma and Emile Poirier have set this piece of their farm aside for limited grazing. They're protecting it from the plow for the sake of the other forms of life it supports. The hole that you see in front here is one of the holes made by uh, gophers, which was later inhabited by burrowing owls. We could have cultivated all of this particular area, but a few years ago when we first saw the burrowing owls here, we became quite interested in them. Burrowing owls are now as rare as untouched prairie. They can't survive in plowland. All they need is a small area left unturned, a little room. It's always a struggle as to whether uh, we should break up the land or not, whether we should just leave this natural land, because the productivity of this land is very low. Uh, the little area that we've left here would perhaps support one cow for a whole summer. It's not so productive that way, but if we were to break it up and it, we were to grow wheat here, we could triple or quadruple the income that we would get off this area. And yet, there must be something that we'll keep back. And so we, we have to hold back a place for the burrowing owl. Individuals like the Perros and the Poiriers are starting to act, but the grasslands are still being plowed. Our agriculture is driven by economics rather than good husbandry. Farmers have always been forced to expand to make ends meet. Environmentalist Keith Newfeld. The overwhelming um, historical precedent is that of development, is of transforming um, wilderness into short-term resources. We as the consumers have to turn that back and say, hey, we, we want to consu um, consume food, we want to consume um, industrial pro um, goods and processes, but in fact we also want to preserve native areas. Undisturbed, this environment is richly productive, filled with life. There's an ancient order here the swift fox was once part of. The effort to return it to the prairie sunlight has been directed by Dr. Stephen Herrero. We uh, want to reintroduce swift ox to the Canadian prairie because they were, they were part of the landscape for thousands of years. They lived with the bison, the wolves, 
the elk, the grizzly bears, and the early settlers. And they weren't eliminated because they were a, a predator or a problem. They were eliminated through man's carelessness. Repairing that carelessness began with breeding the foxes in captivity. After 15 years, this ranch in Cochrane, Alberta, now has the largest concentration of swift foxes in the country. It's called the Wildlife Reserve of Western Canada. Pauline Rhodes has charge of about 50 foxes here. She's doling out their daily supply of dead chicks from the local hatchery. Some were born here. Others come from the central United States, where they still survive in the wild and where they're still hunted. The mix of wild and captive-born foxes helps to protect them from becoming inbred. try and keep them in as natural way as we can, albeit they are in pens. Pens average around 1,500 square feet. We put a pair of compatible foxes in a pen and hope that they reproduce. This ranch was started in 1973 by Miles and Beryl Smeaton. I came up to see my daughter, who had uh, come back from Africa and was working at the Calgary Zoo, looking after the children's zoo. And uh, she brought two rhinos, an ostrich and a buffalo from Africa. And she said, why don't you do something like this? And so we thought, well, that would be a good idea if we bought some land here. I was a sort of follower on, you know. I hunted foxes and I was keen on horses and things like that. Horses and dogs and hounds. As my wife was really the animal lover and so she brought the, the foxes here. They were already in cub. So we got a family and uh, we took two cubs to learn something about them. Brought them up rather as pets. And being nocturnal, they were terrible things to bring up, at least I thought they were. They made an awful noise during the night and uh, played going around the room without touching the floor and things like that. Our original goals were to return the fox to its natural, the place where it came from. It's a goal that's taking years to achieve. Even with meticulous care, the foxes are at risk. Suffering the stresses of captivity, such as crowding and competition, they're vulnerable to epidemics, fights, and to the effects of inbreeding. But it's the only choice left now. The numbers have to be multiplied in captivity before reintroduction can begin. The future of the swift fox now depends on the human world. At Calgary Zoo, under looming reminders of an earlier and permanent extinction, visitors learn about very recent losses. Zoo director, Peter Karsten. The two foxes you see here are Audi and Tika. They are really ambassadors for their species. They are uh, what you might call a star attraction in this whole concept of uh, uh, reviving the prairies and re-establishing species that, that became extinct or extirpated. What do you think he eats? We hope to uh, educate the public about this animal, which is really one that should be living right in their backyard. Separate breeding programs here at the zoo, as well as at the Moose Jaw Wild Animal Park and at the Smeaton Ranch, safeguard the foxes while their numbers build. We all work together and we interchange animals in order to pair up genetically the most suitable animals, always bearing in mind their temperament because uh, foxes don't like each other. They, 
don't get along. They can, in fact, kill each other if they don't like each other, and they certainly won't breed. In the immediate future, we're doing really well with the breeding program. We've got twice as many litters as last year, and uh, I hope that we can raise even more foxes to put out into the wild. The long-term future, well, I don't know. I really don't know. It costs a lot of money to keep a place like this going, and uh, it takes a lot of work, too. In a community pasture in southern Saskatchewan, a group of swift foxes is about to be set free. You got a rock or blueberry? Okay. Oh, turn the wrong way. Taken from the safety of its wooden burrow, the fox is readied for release. Right over his head. Covering yeah. the head helps to calm it down. Yeah, I've got the hindquarters. Okay. You okay there, Dwight? Mm -hmm. A radio collar will allow researchers to track it for up to a year. Now, when that collar swings around, where will that antenna be? Back. The back end. Inoculations protect it from diseases such as canine distemper and rabies. Each fox has notched and tattooed ears Five. for permanent identification. Five, six, S. Now the pathway to freedom is open. The wooden burrow is returned to the earth, and the foxes are left to make their own way out. This is called a soft release. It's designed to soften the impact of a new environment on foxes raised in captivity. It's the method used in earlier releases in Alberta. A breeding pair lived all winter here in the pen at the release site, and their cubs were born here in the spring. Now it's late summer. There's no headlong rush to freedom, the foxes make tentative excursions beyond the wire, testing out the dangerous wild world. Food is provided for a while, but they soon learn to hunt for themselves. This little fox the size of a house cat can run down and kill a jackrabbit like this one, reaching speeds of 60 kilometers an hour. There's no lack of prey. The swift fox will eat birds, small mammals like ground squirrels and mice, insects, frogs, even vegetation. And they also eat carrion. Anything left over will be buried for later. Starvation has not been the major threat for released foxes. What they have to learn is caution, because they don't have any predators on them here. Whereas in the wild, they would have coyotes as foe and bobcats and lynx. The danger is always there. Since 1983, 250 foxes have been released here and in southern Alberta. More than half of those whose fate is known were taken by coyotes. There was too little time for them to learn caution. Since the wolf was eradicated early in this century, the coyote has been the largest prairie predator. And for coyotes, the swift fox is an intruder. This coyote has been checking the pen all winter long on its regular hunting run. While they have the pen as a bolt hole, these foxes are probably safe. But in a few weeks, they'll disperse to new den sites, and their understanding of the wild will be severely tested.
Once the foxes disperse, researchers try to monitor them to see how well they survive. But finding these elusive nocturnal hunters is a major problem. Filmed with a light intensifier, this is a rare glimpse of the outcome of a night's hunting, a large jackrabbit. A radio collar means foxes can be tracked to their new den sites, but the bulky collars may make them more vulnerable by preventing a quick escape down a narrow bolt hole. This collar somehow fell off. Its wearer's fate remains a mystery. Of the 250 foxes released so far, perhaps 10 breeding pairs survive today, somewhere out there in the prairie grasses. There may also be some solitary foxes, no one knows for sure. The risks of reintroduction are very high. Every species has its place in a natural environment, a way of life tested by time, shaped by its habitat. Its safety lies in keeping that place. We have to constantly remember, though, that in fact wildlife is dependent upon wild lands. That wildlife in isolation from wild lands will vanish. The swift fox is an example of a species whose demise has been more immediately or directly related to human actions than perhaps others. Other species such as the white pelican, such as the burrowing owl, the ferruginous hawk, are all examples of habitat destruction. And in fact, when we destroy wild land habitat, wild life itself is the next to go. Can we leave room for the burrowing owl? Or must all the life that remains on the prairies go the way of the bison? Like it or not, we're now the custodians of their future. And once they're gone, they may be gone forever. The swift fox vanished from the Canadian prairie 50 years ago. Trying to bring it back has already cost more than half a million dollars, and it's still not certain that the effort will succeed. It's a desolate world we're creating for ourselves, but perhaps we're finally beginning to realize it. The attempt to return the swift fox to the wild comes from a deep sense of loss and longing. There has to be some aesthetic appeal in life. Something that takes the eye, that the eye looks at, you know, and, and something that we can behold that is beautiful, something that is more than we can ever be. More than we can ever be all by ourselves. As the light dies across the prairie, fox cubs play in the short grass once again. But even here, the plowland's creeping closer. Is this a lost cause? Or is it a glimpse of hope, a turning point in a century of destruction? <laughs> 